Good morning, Fort Church. Good morning. Wow. Wow. What's up? <laughs> we thought we got enough chairs. It didn't work, did it? Amen. Amen. Wow. I'm so happy to see you guys. Let me ask y'all to do something, though, just, just, just for the sake of the people that are standing. If there is a seat to the, to the inside of you, I know. Look, hold on, hold on. Let's do this first. I got something better. Turn to the person beside you and say, you look nice this morning. Come on now, I saw some of the guys. If you're single, wait till after the service, okay? Let's just wait, all right, to swap your numbers. But um, look guys, just so everybody will have a seat, if there's a seat to the inside of you and you can, would you just slide over to that seat just to make room for, for everybody? And guys, if you'll help Doug and Rodney as you're passing out Bibles, if you'll see seats, just let everybody have a seat. There's so many people standing this morning, that would be awesome, okay? You good? Everybody do it. We'll let everybody get there. While, while everybody's getting seated, turn your Bibles. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, okay? <clears throat> I'm going to lose my voice. This is like the marathon preaching morning. I'm excited about it. I'm, I don't know how many people got saved at the downtown campus, but when I left, they were still raising their hands and just seeing who Jesus is. So we are super excited about that. And um, hey, there was not really one person in the seats that were from the like the, the main campus. So it was literally all new people. It was full and they were standing they opened the windows. I am gonna need like a bottle of water. They opened the windows outside and people were standing in the front yard to just hear the message. Like that's that was pretty amazing. So so but I can tell you this, out of all the hard work, chair moving, marathon stuff, two months of work, uh, everything that's done, moving, changing, thanks Rodney, everything that's moving and changing and going, I want to tell you all that is for one reason, and that is to glorify, magnify, and make a big deal out of Jesus Christ, okay? So none of it is for us. It's really all about Jesus. So if you're new to church or you're new to the Fort Church today, I'm going to give you the coolest thing. You'll fit right in. If I ever ask a question, just answer Jesus, and in some roundabout way, you will be correct. Amen. <laughs> it's all about Jesus, and we're going to study that this morning. So uh, open up your Bibles. The guys have already, I didn't say it, but if you don't have a Bible, the guys are in the back. Just raise your hand. I need a Bible. I want to tell you this. We love our Bibles. We do a lot of like computer reading of Bibles, and we put verses on the screen. We love the Bible. All right, but I'm going to tell you why we love the Bible, and this has just really been impressed upon my heart. We love the Bible like we we believe in the Bible like we believe in the sun. Is it not that we can see it, but that by it we can see everything else? Amen. So it's through God's word that we're able to see. It's through the word and the work and the person of Jesus that we are able to see who we are and God can take us from where we are to where he wants us to be. It is not about condemnation. It is about restoration and redemption and the love and the power and the grace of Jesus. And that is what Easter is all about. So today we're going to read a story that's pretty unfamiliar for an Easter story. But if you've been here more than once, you know unfamiliar is where we live. And so we love that. And we're going to read a story to you today in a sermon titled Unchained, but it's a message about a man, Jesus Christ, who saves another man named Barabbas. I want you all say that with me. Say Barabbas. Barabbas. 
All right, you got it. Let's pray. Amen. Have the invitation. Just kidding. All right, Matthew chapter 27, verses 11 and following. Okay, so um, here we go. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, and this is a question that we will all ask at one point in our lives, are you the king of the Jews? In other words, are you who you say you are? That's a question that for any of us, for all of us, for everyone in the world, we will answer either in this life or the next. Who do you say I am? Who do you say that Jesus is? That's a question that we will all ask. And there's this point to where Pontius Pilate, we've all heard this story. We're all from Alabama or Georgia. Amen. Well, some of y'all are from Ohio and Texas. And Lord, we love our church. But right now we live in the South. Amen. And we've all heard about Jesus, the Bible, and Easter. Amen. Y'all with me? Y'all do look nice, by the way. I wasn't like a trick. Y'all look good. I got my church clothes on. I don't know about y'all. You know what I'm saying? I don't ever wear a suit, so y'all know how funny that is if y'all, y'all know me. Uh, somebody said, are you going to a funeral? I said, well, you know, <laughs> sort of. Um, but no, yeah. But anyway, so, but ultimately, for all of us, we've heard the Easter story. Amen. We've heard what it's about. We know about the empty tomb. We know about the cross. We've all been there. We've grown up in it. We love Easter egg hunts. I love that we wear pink. Amen. You got to be comfortable. Wear pink time. Just tell you. And you wear pink and you dress up and our families match. I love seeing our families that match. We look so beautiful. And we all kind of understand this is a big, important day. But here's the question I want to pose to you this morning. What does the message and the truth behind Easter mean for you? What does the message mean? Where is this change? Is it just another holiday? Is it just another event? Is it just another celebration? Or could it be that this day and the truth behind this day is a reality that everything can be different? Is there not a chance? Is there not a chance this morning? That's just really where I want to meet you. I just want to meet you at the point of could it be that there is a love and a God and a grace that is so abounding and so overwhelming and so effortless and so efforting and so audacious and so, and so great and so beyond and so magnificent that he could take the sinner of sinners and turn him into the most righteous person to the blood of Jesus that would cover us, that we would be set free to be who God intended us to be. Could that be Easter for you and for me? And there's this story that we run into where Jesus is put on trial. Jesus is kind of getting to this point. We know he's going to the cross. We know he's going to do the work. We know he's going to be whipped. And we find ourselves standing at a point to where Jesus is put on trial. Now, how about this? The king of kings, who where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, is put on trial for the people to say, who are you? Who do you say you are? And he stands before Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate says, they're all bringing me and they're all accusing you of being who you say you are. Are you the king of the Jews? And I love Jesus' response. He looks at him and he says, you've said so. Now you start, you take him back. You're like, why wouldn't Jesus just say, I am who I say I am? Because Jesus doesn't have to prove who he is to us because he knows who he is in and of himself. That's God. You see, if God has to prove himself to you and I, he's not God anymore. He's not the one who created us. He's not the one by his own word spoke creation into existence. He's no longer God. And so he just looks at Pontius Pilate and he says, man, I agree with you. You said it, right? And you go on down and he looks at it and he says in verse 12, but when Jesus, all right, but when he was accused by the chief priest and the elders, he did what? He gave no answer. I love this. Jesus is like, they're like, are you, are you Jesus? Are you who you say you are? Are you really Jesus? He's already, they've already seen his miracles. They've already seen the the love. They've already seen his teaching, and they can't find anything wrong with it. Let me give you a little background here. Jesus has been up all night long. He's been interrogated. He's been beaten. He's been abused. He's been neglected. He's sleep deprived. He's exhausted. And they're bringing him before Pontius Pilate, and they want him to be crucified. They say, Jesus, we're going to put him to death because he's not who he says he is. I don't believe in him. Let me put him to death. Let me just do away with Jesus. And Jesus stands in silence because he knows the work that he has to do. It's amazing. And so he stands, and when the chief priests and elders asked, said, who will you say you are? Jesus didn't say a word. You know, in Jesus' mind, he's like, even if I told you, you wouldn't believe. Even if you saw, Jesus said this, he said, even if you saw a dead man raised to life, they still will not believe. It's amazing. And he says, Oh, the Bible flipped. And he says, and he gave no answer. Verse 13, then Pilate said to him, 
Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not to even a single charge, so that Pilate stood before Jesus Christ and was greatly amazed. That's amazing. Now, you just, let's just use our sanctified imagination this morning, okay? Let's just put ourselves there. Jesus is brought before an angry mob to be crucified and put to death because Jesus simply told the truth. This is, this is a miracle, guys. This is not like, listen, this is not Easter eggs and little chickens. This is big stuff. And Jesus is brought before all the people, not because he's done anything wrong, but because he is the spotless, sinless lamb of God. Can you get anything more innocent than a lamb? Seriously? Like, do you hate on lambs? I mean, for real. I said lamb. It's white lamb. Fluffy over there baying all the time. You don't. <laughs> Fluffy, we said that last week. That's my lamb's name. I don't know much about and, and you know what the lamb does? He just, he is who he says he is. And he stands in silent. And Pilate is so greatly amazed that Jesus could come to Pilate like we would do and say, set me free, set me free. Please, 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 please. Yes, I am who I say I am. And Jesus stands and says, Father, I'm ready to do your will. I'm ready to go to the cross. I'm ready to give my life because I love my people. Because I'm a dad who loves his children, not a vice principal spanking them all the time. And so look at what happens right here in verse 15. He says, now at the feast, this is the Passover, all right, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner who they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called who? Barabbas. Let's say that again, called who? Barabbas. So when they had gathered Pilate, they said to them, who do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Son of Christ? Now, now, now Pilate's got a little trick up his sleeve. Pilate's all about Pilate, all right? He's just like the majority of us. He's worried about himself. He's popping his Roman Under Armour outfit. You know what I'm saying? He's like, I'm good with me, all right? And he said, I got Jesus over here. And he's like, if I don't condemn Jesus, then I'm going to have a riot. And if I do condemn him, then his followers are possibly going to riot. And so he's like, what do I do? And so he's pretty sneaky. He's pretty conniving. He's not the governor. He's in politics, okay? And so he's like, all right, I got you. I got you. I got a little trick up my sleeve. He said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the worst of the worst of the worst guy, the notorious prisoner named Barabbas. They all knew who Barabbas was, right? The, the gospels are so cool. They record Barabbas in all four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And from what we can gather from Barabbas, he's not, he is a, uh, he's just a bad guy. I just don't know how to say it. He is not a lamb. Okay, right. Barabbas, he ain't got no teeth. I don't know what's going on with him. That's how we see him. You know what I'm saying? Like, dude, just, he just been on meth too long. I don't know what's going on. He's just trapped in addiction, right? And the Bible says that he is a rebel. He is a leader of an insurrection. And then it drops it down and it says he's a murderer. He's a murderer. He's a bad guy. He's a thug. He's a rebel. And Pilate looks at him and he says, I'm going to bring out Barabbas. And then I can get out of putting Jesus to death because surely they won't accept Barabbas. Surely they'll say, let us set Jesus free. And then look what happens in the Bible. It says, verse 19. Uh, no, no, no. Let's go back. Let's go back. Verse 17. So when they gathered, Pilate said to them, who do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he knew, look at this, if you write in your Bibles or you, or you keep up with them, look at this. In verse 18, this is one you should underline. For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Not that Jesus had, had done anything wrong, but that they didn't want anything to do with Jesus. Amen. Like They're like, huh? we're going to put Jesus on trial and we're going to condemn Jesus because I'm jealous of who he is. And I'm really happy with who I am. That's what they were saying. Because this is the religious crowd. I'll go ahead and get to it, right? And he, and he looks at me and says, it's out of envy. Let me finish reading. I just want to get to this. This is so exciting. I'm telling y'all. And he, he looks at him and he says, for he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides why he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him. And his wife even looks at him and says, have nothing to do with this righteous man. For I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priest, this is the religious crowd and the elders, they persuaded the crowd so there's a crowd that's gathered. They persuaded the crowd to get them to release Barabbas. They're like, listen, he's one of us. Let's get Barabbas released. And he says to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Verse 21, the governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, and he asked them the question that we would all ask in our own lives. Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? What do we do with him? And the people look out and they say, crucify him. Whoa. 
Can you, can you see Pilate? What do y'all want me to do with Jesus? Crucify him. Crucify him. What has he done? Oh, we're not really concerned about that. We just want to, we just want to put him to death. Pilate asked the question. He says, what is this man to deserve, done to deserve death? And they can't answer. They just say, crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. I want to show you this morning that I am Barabbas. That in my life I am full of chains and I am bound by the things that I want in my own life. And it is not my effort. It is not my work. It is not my goodness nor my focus on how well I can be a Christian that sets me free. It is simply the love and the blood of Jesus. Y'all pray with me real quick. God, we just want to come to you this morning with a, with a set heart and a, and a mind towards you. God, would you remove the things of the world from us this morning and give us these next 15 uh, 17 minutes, God, just to focus on you. Give us that pull. Give us that heart. Give us that clearness. Give us that clarity. Give us that, give us that surrender that it takes to realize the work of the spotless, sinless Son of God who would be silent and go to the cross and become death so that I would be set free. God, would we focus on that and focus on the life-changing message of Jesus and, and it's in his beautiful, glorious, matchless grace name that we pray. And everybody says... Amen. All right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to see three things in the story. I want you to see the crowd that's gathered together, okay? You saw in the very beginning it says that Pilate's there and he's going to judge it. So Pilate's going to stand right here. He's going to be a judge, okay? And they're going to bring Jesus into the court and they're going to look at him. And there's this crowd that's gathered together for the trial to begin. And this is really convicting to me this week because I said sometimes I feel like we do that at church. I said sometimes I think I show up to church and I'm going to put Jesus on trial and say, Jesus, you're either going to do something for me and prove who you are and then I will follow you or you are not who you say you are and I don't want to have any to do with. And so I really see this crowd gathered together. And the first part of the crowd, the ones that are most predominant in the story right here are who? The religious crowd. These are the church folks. They're in there. They know what it means to do for God. These are these people. They come in. I'm talking about they, they tithe out of their spice rack. They're so holy. You know what I'm saying? They got 17 prayer times a day. You know what I'm talking about? They're the folks that you and I hate. I'm just telling you. Right? They're the folks. You're like, what are you doing? I'm just coming out of my seventh prayer time for you. What can I do for you? Can I pray for you? Because I'm so holy. And you're just like, I don't know. You're freaking me out, dude. You know what I'm saying? Like, can I leave now? You know what I'm talking about? Because what they're doing is not, in, it's not, it's okay to have 17 prayer times and a heart for God, but I, you, the world doesn't need to know that. God knows your devotion toward him, but there's so many people that want to run out and say, I'm devoted to God. You, you suck. You're like, dang, man, I know. Can I? I got some addictions and sins. It doesn't matter. It's because you're not dedicated like I am. These are the people. Y'all are steadily thinking of people you know. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Uh, I know some of those people too. Um, but he, because here's, <laughs> I'm going to get there. There's a reason I said that. It was out of context. But anyway. All right. So listen, you know those people. And so they're looking at you and we're saying, hold on, I'm broken. I'm hurting. I'm suffering. Life has got me down. I'm trapped. I don't know what to do. And they're going to say, you're just not devoted to God. You don't love Jesus. And you're looking up and saying, I just, I want to know who Jesus is. Will you help me? Oh, I don't really know about Jesus. You just need to be devoted to God. And that's that religious crowd. That's why they hated Jesus. Because Jesus walks in and he says, you know, in all your devotion, in all your work, in all your effort, it all points toward me. Wow. They're like, hold on, hold on, hold on. You mean everything that I've built my life on? I'm talking about I'm rocking my Jesus robe. You're saying this is not enough to please God? And he says, not unless you know me. And you're thinking, what do you mean? And he says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have life. And he says, but the scriptures point to me. And the people go, oh, no, 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 no. It can't be. It can't be. It can't be that simple that Jesus loves me and would give his life for me. It just can't. And then there's a whole other crowd that stands behind them. And these are all the people that follow those people. Y'all know them people? Those people to follow those people that you don't like? You know what I'm talking about? Those people because they're trying to be like those people. And you're thinking, why are you trying to be like those people? You don't even really like those people. But you're doing what those people say. Y'all know who I'm talking about? It's like the middleman boss at work. Y'all know who I'm talking about? You know what I mean? It's like they don't know why they're doing what they're doing. But they just said to do it. So I'm going to do it. You're like, this don't make any sense. Stand on your one leg. I don't know why I should stand on my leg. Well, such and such said stand on your legs, so you better do it because 
there's a benefit. And you're like, no, it doesn't matter. And that part of the crowd is there. And this is the part of the crowd that really ends up being just the ones who are just indifferent to what's going on. And then there's this other part of the crowd that have seen the work of Jesus. They've seen him take mud and build little balls and stick in the eye sockets and a man can see. They've seen him reach down by the pool of Siloam and pull up a man who was lame since birth and stand up and walk. They've seen him heal leprosy. They've seen him raise a dead man to life and they're there and they can't say anything. And then all of a sudden, the weirdest trial and the most contradicting story I think in all of the Bible takes place where you have Jesus on the, well, let's see if I do it right because I was back. Jesus on the right hand side the sinless, son of, the sinless Son of God and the spotless Lamb who was given for the people. And then you have Barabbas. And I've always read this story. I want to share this with you. I've always read this story and said, thank God I'm not like Barabbas. You know what I'm talking about? I've always looked at that and said, I'm not Barabbas. I'm not the guy over there just standing there. But then I realized that there's all these chains that I carry in life myself. There's all these chains that I put on, whether by choice or by force, that simply weigh me down in the life that God has given me. There's chains that I carry. And I began thinking about it this week and talking with the staff and reading and studying and praying and all the work that we're doing for God and realizing that it is the work of Jesus that takes those chains off, right? And I'm just like, how does all this work? How does this play out? What are you talking about? And I start to see what sin looks like in my life. You see, they talk about Barabbas, that he's a thug and a rebel. And Jesus is the son of the living God. Well, Barabbas is just trying to be somebody in the world. Y'all stay with me right here. Jesus, I mean, Barabbas, he's just trying to get along. He's just trying to go through, get his paycheck this week. You know what I'm talking about? He's just trying to check in the boss. He's not trying to be anything bad. He's just trying to be something in the world. Before I pass out, right? So Barabbas, what happens is Barabbas just realizes what all of us realize in life is sin that tries to make that identity for us is sin. And sin comes in all kind of forms and all kind of fashion. Sins and looks in, in, in all other ways. Sin is what we think everybody else is doing and not ourselves. Amen. But sin results itself in one of the biggest things in my life through pride. Through pride. See, I'm Barabbas because I want the pride of being somebody. I want to, you know, and this is so cool. Pride starts in Little League, I believe. <laughs> Between the dads cussing each other out about their son and then the kids going, I'm better than you. You need to sit on the bench and I'm going over here. I just think it starts in a little league, I believe. <laughs> or maybe daycare. That's my pacifier. <laughs> I don't know. But pride is universal, I believe. You know what I mean? Pride is universal. Mine is universal. It's just, you, know, you don't have to teach your baby to say mine. All the moms who have infants say, amen. You know, it's just a natural force. It's mine. And it's just pride in our life. And pride is one of the beginning sins that all other sins root and sprout from. It's the sin that the devil fell from heaven with. When Lucifer looked up and he said, no, you're not God. I'm God. I'll make the decisions. I'll make the choices. I'll make my own way. That's pride. I don't need God anymore. And what happens is that's just a chain that I carry in my life. And so I put on the, the sin of pride and I just sort of walk around with it, right? And what happens, this is so interesting in life, the chains that we, be, that, that we bear, the chains that we, that we carry, the sin that walks around with us, we just get used to it. This is so, this is so strange about sin. We just, start, we just start adapting with our sin. Paul said, oh, what a wretch I am. Because he says, my body tells me to do one thing and my spirit tells me to do another and I just give in to my flesh. He says, I just, I just battle with it all the time. But what we try to do is we try to cover it up. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Hold on. I'm finna, I'm finna bust it out right here. Hold on. What's up? How y'all doing? I'm good. Y'all don't see it on my back? Y'all don't see me? So we try to cover it up. The problem is the weight is still there. The problem is I still carry that weight around with me. And then pride starts leading into other things. This is so difficult because we don't see it. They just sort of sneak up on us, right? Pride leads into envy. Y'all with me? How, how we envy other things and what other people have. This is a trick. This is just a trick. You know what I mean? Because it's okay to have a big house. It's cool. Have a big house. Invite me over. <laughs> With swim, whatever you want to do. You know what I mean? I have a big house. It's 100 years old, but it's awesome. All right? I just work on it all the time. All right? And what happens is it's cool to have a big house, right? But not because your neighbor has one. Not because your neighbor has one. It's cool to have a nice car, but not so you'll fit in. Not so you'll fit in. So envy starts driving what we do. We just envy each other. The New Testament call it covetousness. I want what you have. 
And we just get trapped in it. And it's not wrong to be successful. It's not wrong to be uh, prominent. It's not wrong to have good finances. It's wrong to do it because you want to outdo everybody else. And it just becomes a trap. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Did y'all realize how you got all those bills? Think about it. I'm telling you, come to 30th, you're like, what, what the? I had to write all these things. I know I don't need that credit card. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? Y'all with me? It's conviction. And what happens is envy slips in. And then this is so cool. This is like bipolar Christianity right here. All right? <laughs> what happens is you get, you're full of pride and you're carrying those chains around. And then you're full of envy because you want what other people have. And then you get to that point to where you just develop this hate and resentfulness and bitterness in your life. And it comes not because you were wanting to do wrong. It comes because you were wanting to get through. It comes because you're wanting to make a way. It comes because you're wanting to be successful. You're wanting to be accepted. I'm with you. I understand. There's no condemnation in this. This is just a reality that we face. And then this hate comes in, and it's so weird how this hate derives itself. And hate is so interesting in the Bible because, bless you, wow, that was awesome. Let it out. Hate. <laughs> it's just like, wow. That was like an amen and a sneeze. Like say, a sick them to a bulldog. I'm with you. And so... <laughs> So it just let up that tension, didn't you? Good girl. All right, so what happens is, and then hate comes into our life, and hate is so interesting in the Bible because hate has two meanings. Hate has the one meaning, like the religious crowd that's gathered together, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. That kind of hate that's in our life. Y'all know what I'm talking about? When you get angry and your temper comes out and you see the hate and you feel the hate, and it's just hot-tempered, flared-up hate for other people. And then there's another kind of hate, and it's the cold indifference to what's going on around you. It's the rest of the crowd that won't stand up for Jesus even though they know what he's done and they know where he's been. And what happens is one of the most interesting things in life. There comes a point in our life where we realize, I carry these chains. I have hate. I have envy. I have shame. I have regret. I have pain. I have hurt. And I want to be a different person. And then what we try to do is we say, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to church. Woo! I'm going to go to church and I'm going to get with all those people that I don't like. And I'm going to try to do what they do, bipolar Christianity. All right? This is where it's at. Because as long as you're going to church, then things should be good. Amen? It should be good. It should be good. You're good. What's going on with you? Man, I'm good. I'm good. Y'all just come to church. Have a little thing. And went on the way out, ask somebody how they're doing. Just ask them. Like, turn to your neighbor and say, how you doing? Y'all scared? <laughs> right? We got that. You know what I'm saying? I'm good, brother. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. My wife hates me. But I'm good, brother. <laughs> We in church, please, praise God. I know what that means, but how are you doing? Ah, oh, man, you just don't have no idea what's going on. You got, you got 30 minutes. I'll tell you about it, right? But see, what happens is we try to go to church, and then we just do the same thing. Instead of taking off the chains that I thought would set me free, we just start adding more chains. This is so cool. And so what happens is bipolar Christianity. As long as I do good and do what God wants me to do, then things will be good for me. And so I work really, really hard in my strength and my effort and my commitment and my focus of what I can do for God. And what I don't realize is those, I'm just, you can take these chains off. Like you can stop sinning. You can stop lying today on your own because it'll just be your works and your righteousness. And so what'll happen is you'll put these chains down and you'll pick up some new chains of works and righteousness and your effort and your focus and your morality and what you can do for God. And you realize I didn't exchange anything. I just added more weight to my life. Because y'all all know what it's like when I've tried church, I've been there, it didn't work. Let me reach back down and pick up that sin. Let me reach back down and just go back to my old way. Let me go back to Egypt. Let me go back to my former lifestyle. Let me go back to who I was. And I start carrying around these chains and I, and I feel the weight, guys. I'm with you. Y'all with me? I feel the weight and I'm just getting used to it. I'm just going to stand and I'm just going to bear the weight of what it has. And I realize in that moment, that I'm Barabbas, that I'm the one standing opposite of Jesus Christ, the sinless, spotless Son of God who has done no wrong, and I'm holding all these chains that I've put on myself, my works, my righteousness, my effort, my morality, my focus, my devotion, what I give, my sacrifice. You can do all that without Jesus Christ. There's a whole crowd gathered together that represents that exact same truth. And then I look at Jesus and I realize God didn't die for the righteous, but for the sinner. 
I realized that God looked down from heaven and in the silence of Jesus, he looked at Barabbas and said, I love him. I love him. I love you with all your chains and with all your pain, with all your regret and with all your hurt. I'm a dad who loves his child. I love you. And you see the work of the cross. The Bible says that in while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hold on. Not in our works, not in our righteousness, not in our efforts, nor our devotion, but in the midst of our pain. Can you see the picture? Can you see the picture? Can you see Jesus standing on the left-hand side with, with, with mouth closed, head hung low? I can see it. And I can see Barabbas standing there with the weight, knowing full well I'm guilty. I am guilty. I will not stand before you today as somebody delivering a message, whatever my title is, a dad, saying I'm not guilty. I'm guilty. I'm guilty of these chains. I'm guilty of pride. I'm guilty of neglect. I'm guilty of hurting other people and being hurted. And, well, that's not a word. Being hurt myself. It's bad. I'm just telling you that. You know what I'm saying? I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of walking away from God. I don't deserve his love. I don't deserve his grace. I don't deserve these beautiful daughters I have. I don't deserve a loving wife. I don't deserve a house. And I see myself standing on the stage with Jesus. And I see I'm Barabbas. I'm that man. And I look at God and I say, God, you don't know where I've been. And Jesus standing and saying, I still love you. I still love you. I'm, I'm here for you. I'm going to do this work for you that you can't do for yourself. And you can't pull yourself up. And then could it be that it's that simple? Could it be, could there be another way? Could there be another way? Could there be another way to break the chains that hold me down? Could there be another way? Could I try to pull them off and say, no, I'm not going to sin here. And now, now my gift now is humility. You know, one of my best spiritual gifts is humility. I'm so humble. That's just pride. It's not humility. It's just pride. Can it be, I'm going to out-devote you. I'm going to compare myself to you. And I'm going to look and say, they're not as devoted as I am to God. And I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And I'm going to show everybody else. It's pride. And then I'm just going to reach down. I'm just going to pick up more chains. And I'm going to stand before Jesus in those chains. And him look at me and say, son, I know. But I'm still going to set you free. Yeah. That's the cost. That's the cost of a silence of Jesus Christ. That's the cost that no words can do nor work can do outside of what he has done for you and me. And you know the greatest part, there's no record of Barabbas turning around and saying, Jesus, I owe you everything. Look what you've done for me. He just goes free. And you think, could it be, could it be that there is a God that is so loving and so focused on us and focused on himself and focused in us that sees our shame, that sees your walk with all your regret and he looks down and he says, I love you. Could there be that God? Could there be the Jesus that stands on the other side? I see him standing there and see Barabbas going free and I see the chains fall off and I see where he gets to and I see where he gets to that point in his life and Jesus still holds on to the chains and he goes to the cross. He stands out at a whip. He's chained again to a post. And they stand over top of him. And they hit him with lashes on his back. And the Bible says that he was beaten so badly that he couldn't be recognized as a man. That his beard was ripped out and thorns were placed on his head. And Jesus stands silent and will not answer a word. And says, Father, my spirit is ready to send me to do what you do. And I see in the Bible that it says God so loved the world that he would send his only begotten son, that whosoever will respond and believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And it goes on to say, for Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world could be set free. And I see the love of a father. And I can see Barabbas take a step off those Take a turn off of those steps, and I see that last key go in. And I see Jesus turn and look at him with no condemnation, with no regret, and nothing but love. And Jesus takes this one little link in all that we do. I think I got one earlier. He takes this one link. He takes this one part, and no matter how hard I try to break these chains, I realize I'm Barabbas and I stand condemned. And Jesus stands with the cross ahead, the grave, death, and finally the empty tomb and looks at me and you and says, I love you. I want to set you free. He takes that one chain link 
And he doesn't start breaking them off one at a time. This is the grace and love and glory of Jesus that he knows just the right place and just the right day to take those chains, break that one link. And you know what I realized? I have all these empty buckets and I have all these broken chains and it's all because of Jesus that I'm set free. Come on. So I'm going to ask you this morning as we put Jesus on trial one more time, is he who he says he is? Is he the savior of the world or the one who comes to add more chains to your life? How do you view Jesus? How do you view his work of the empty cross and the empty tomb? How do you view the work? How do you view the Savior? Because what can happen is you can keep piling those chains on. I did it for 27 years. I've done a lot of bad things. And you know what most of those bad things did? They made less of me. I look back at my life and I see nothing but empty buckets. Nothing but broken chains. Nothing but lives that are hurt. Nothing but an identity that I searched for until the day that I met Jesus Christ and he unlocked my chains and set me free. I want to ask you today, are you carrying those chains or is today the day? Is today the day that Jesus has decided for you to be set free? Will you all pray with me?